talk about racing? Thank you. And I did hear from um, some other folks on the Lake Harry Yacht Club board who are interested in continuing having conversations online about racing in the coming weeks. So um, we'll be talking more about that. Uh, so watch Slack and your emails for um, links to further conversations as we go forward. So um, my co-host today is Joe Ranke, who is an accomplished racer. He used to be in the Lake Harry, um, in the Twin Cities Sailing Club and went on to buy his own boat and um, was his top um, racer in the Upper Minnetonka racing program, helping get that going. And, um, and he's a racer um, in the Carrot Yacht Club as well. So he's gonna be talking to us um, in this presentation about some um, areas that uh, we can be focused on. Now I did send a handout to everyone and I hope that you're able to see that. Um, there was a link in your email and let me see. I'm going to open that again. Um, and it's called, um, the document is Racing Checklists Audience Outline. So um, we're going to be talking about some racing checklists, and then Joe's going to get into racing sailing fundamentals and the race sailing cycle. But um, the, the key, the thing that I wanted to talk about is. Um, Cynthia, Why? before you start, I would suggest we put the presentation in uh, the PowerPoint and presentation view. There should be a button at the top right. In Not in presentation view. Let me check on that. So, um, do you see that? Do you see that next slide? Whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay. There's that button there. Yes, that says present. There we go. So that's what I wanted to. Okay, so how did how did we come up with this idea of checklists? Well, John Berg, our former racing uh, coordinator, had his own checklist. And um, but my ideas about checklists came from um, my previous life as a teacher. I was a Montessori teacher first, and one of the tax, uh, things we used to do in Montessori teaching was task analysis. It's we would teach children how to do something complicated by breaking a larger task into a list of its component parts or steps and we would teach them one step at a time. And um, more recently, I've read this book called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, which really um, hit home to me because I love checklists. And um, what I find about having a checklist though is when, in his book, he was talking about having a checklist that everybody agreed upon and everybody would follow. But when it comes to my checklists, I like to make my own checklist and, and you might have a, your, your own checklist, your own version, and it could be different. But what happens when you have a checklist is that you are able to um, add following that checklist in as a new habit and make it automatic. And you might've heard about this, um, technique called habit stacking, whereas if you want to add a new habit, you um, add it to something you're already doing so that you um, help make that new habit automatic. And then when you got that new habit automatic, it frees up your brain energy just so you can focus on other things. And so um, you don't have to keep remembering to read the checklist or find the checklist, it just becomes automatic. And so that's what I'm hoping that you will get out of this. So feel free to write down anything that comes to mind as you um, hear about these checklists that we have. And certainly my checklist is gonna be different from Joe's checklist or John Berg's checklist. Um, I wear glasses, so that's a, that's a factor in my checklist. Somebody who doesn't wear glasses, that, that might be a different item. So let's move along here. Um, when we, whoops, so what are the things we want to have on our checklist so that we're ready to go out racing? And um, for some of you, racing is a whole new thing. Going sailing may not be a whole new thing, 
And so you might have already developed some habits and some checklists to get you ready to get down there to go sailing. When you're going racing, you're going to tweak those a little, just a little bit. So when you're thinking, okay, I think there's going to be a race. I want to race in that race on in a couple of days. What am I going to do? Well, before the race, we want to um, maybe um, think about what are we going to do the day before? So here's where I'd like you to open up your um, mics so they're not on mute and chime in and let me know what um, you would put in your um, pre-race checklist. What are you going to do a couple of days before? Weather. Spaghetti dinner. Yes. Lots spaghetti. of water. What? Uh... That's an interesting one. Um, spaghetti dinner and can you say more about the spaghetti dinner because i'm just thinking about running and being in triathlon i have no idea what i would do with the pre-race right now but no one was talking and i was breaking the ice so very good carb loading carb loading <laughs> that might be a thing for you i don't necessarily need carb loading and so i but don't eating is important your body needs fuel yeah. absolutely yeah. healthy eating and if carb loading is an important part for you you want to do that. But you also mentioned the web. Oh, right, Ryan here. So I actually do like a hot day. I think about hydration a lot and like getting electrolytes and having enough water. S similar to running. I suppose you feel it still out there. I mean, I, I feel it a day after sailing. Like it's, it takes it out of you, so. Hmm. So I'm gonna. Yeah, Ryan, you mentioned electrolytes. What do you use for electrolytes aside from just the plain water? No, just eating healthy, eating mm. the whatever sodium, potassium, or magnesium, manganese, mm -hmm. the types of healthy foods that have those. Yeah. Yeah, people will recommend like a Gatorade along with a water bottle or something like that. I don't like Gatorade because of the sugar content, but I have some electrolyte tablets. So I bring two water bottles, one with just water and one with water and an electrolyte tablet. Oh, okay, I'm gonna change my screen here. I think if you hit the escape key, Cynthia, you can leave prison mode and then you'll be able to type. Great. Sorry. You definitely can't think as clearly if you're dehydrated. Okay. Hydrate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Something weird happened. You may have deleted the slide. I would hit the back arrow. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. No worries. So we're in hydrate. And you mentioned electrolyte, um, adding that to your water. Do you have a favorite brand? Yeah, let me check it one sec. And then somebody else mentioned checking the weather. So that's a huge part of my planning is looking, what kind of wind is it gonna be? Is it gonna be huge wind where I might decide to um, be crew for John Berg or um, you know, Joe or Ryan might say, okay, I'm gonna have to recruit crew. Who's available to come down to the lake in case I need crew? John Berg can be your crew. Yeah. <laughs> he could be. I prefer <laughs> it the other way around, but that's just my thought. Um, and the other thing um, is what do I need to wear? If it's going to be rainy or might be lightning, I would definitely want to plan on I'm going to have um, long johns underneath my gear, if I'm going to have rain gear, things like that. But you always want to check the weather. If it's going to be a really, really hot day, you're definitely going to be planning on hydrating the day before. Make sure you're really well hydrated when you get down there. The brand I use is called Noon, N-U-U-N. N. They're great, they're fairly inexpensive, and they taste good. Okay, I'll have to look for that one.
So when you're checking the weather, anybody have any favorite uh, um, weather apps? Because mine is definitely NOAA, weather.gov. And um, I'm sure others have preferred weather apps. Windfinder. Uh, windy is another good one. How do you spell windy? Is it W-Y? Windy? No, it's just W-I-N-D-Y. Yeah, I use, I use NOAA and predict wind. Oh, yeah. So, whoops, did I put those in the wrong place? Three rigs. Oh, shoot. No, that's fine. I think. Anyway, that was, that was supposed to be the, the slide about before, a few days before. Um, I'm going to. Let's see. just capture them all here. Yeah. Um, so this was pre-race. Okay. We, we, when we were heading down to the course, um, okay, this would be two, you know, a, a day, days before. And then we have this, the next one is, is when we're um, leaving the house. Okay. So definitely a PFD and a watch. That's not something that, um, that most, uh, TCSE people would think about, but you cannot sail without a watch. I mean, I don't know how you do it. Um, do any others want to call her out? Sunglasses. Oh. sunglasses. Polarized sunglasses help you see the shifts of wind on the water um, better than um, any other kind of polarized. And gloves those are two things that every right. once in a while i'll forget gloves and or and or sunglasses and it's like at that point like oh do i even yeah. want to go out i'm not yeah. sure yeah um, so those yeah. are you know really key i have i because the gloves have a velcro strap on them i strap them to my phd oh. after i you know when i come home from the lake and rinse them out and hang them up to dry when i take them off the line i put them back on my phd so that i, I don't forget them. um you always want to have sunscreen, and uh, for some people, they might wear a hat. I don't wear a hat. Um, with the sunglasses, I definitely have to have that um, strap on the back so that they don't end up on the lake. One tip about the sailing gloves. Um, you can go to West Marine, you can buy sailing gloves, and they're like 50 bucks, or you can buy on Amazon for 25 or 30 bucks. I've been buying these ultra lightweight gardening gloves and it's a pack of 12 for, for like $15. And I think I only went through two pairs last season and I say four to five times a week. And they're, um, if you like your fingers uncovered, they're not great, but I found it didn't bother me. If I really need that dexterity, I'll just take the glove off. So. Anything? else we missed watch well oh water yeah. bottle water bottles exactly uh, um, and then one more weather service um i look at the lake harriet weather station um you can get to that on weather underground um and i think there's also a link on the the website but i mean so that um is sometimes better on some days than others. It depends on the actual wind direction. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really good if the wind's coming from the south, which it's usually coming from the south during the summer. So also a new thing uh, this year to mention on this is if the weather's at all questionable, check your online sources, email or Slack. We haven't figured out how, but we're going to be trying to make calls earlier, uh, you know, if there's social distancing in place, uh, you know, let folks know maybe that uh, we're still figuring out what we're going to change on that, but we may be a little more aggressive on uh, canceling races. Yeah. Okay. Let's move, let's move on to the next um, slide. And, oops, did I mess these up? <gasps> Okay, I put them in the wrong order. That's okay, I'll fix that later. Um, so now you're down at the lake. I definitely, um, I'm looking at the, 
at the, um, the lake again once I've got to the lake because whatever I thought the wind was going to be, um, I just want to stand there and just look out at the lake and scope out what are the conditions. Again, I might be making a decision right then. This is way too windy for me. I need crew or I need to be crew. Um, and you didn't anticipate that from your predictions, but once you're there, you're looking out and you see white caps. I'm like, whoa, okay, this is different. So um, I scope out the lake. Um, the other thing I'm looking for is wind direction. Um, and this is gonna tell me where they might be setting up the course so that I know, oh, they're gonna have the start line way, way down at the south end. I better get out there fast so I have plenty of time to get down to the south end. Um, if it's a light wind day, it takes a long time to sail all the way down to the south end of the lake. So you don't want to waste a ton of time if you know you have a long way to go and the wind is light. Um, so I'm looking at that as well. Whereas if the wind direction tells me, oh, the start line is going to be right up here near the, the launch, okay, then I, I have plenty of time because uh, it's, I don't have as far to go. Um, the other things I'm looking at is um, just the, the favored side of the lake. It looks like kind of glassy over on that side, but got a little bit more wind on this side. Oh, and the really important thing for TCSC racers is sign up for a boat. Uh, that's the first thing I do. Um, and we'll talk more about that once we get down there on the lake. But um, it's important for TCSC racers to sign up for what boat you want to take out. Uh, anything else you're doing before you get on the taxi boat? Stretching. Will there be a taxi boat with social distancing? To be determined. I don't know yet. It's <laughs> so much to be determined. We're still trying to work out what it's going to look like. And then once we get out to the your boat, you want to rig it and um, then start sailing out to the course. Um, you want to practice a few tacks and jibes just to warm yourself up. Um, I think Ryan said he does 10 tacks and 10 jibes before every race. Um, you know, just, and, and the, the point there is you're just getting the feel for getting your body into the rhythm of how you sail, how you move around your boat. Mm. Um, and your mind, body and, and mind. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm, this, is, this is how I do it. And I feel comfortable. I'm feeling, I'm feeling grounded in my, my body about how I do this. Um, and then you can, um, the other things I'm always checking for before I get too far out to the course is, do I have tail tails? My tail tails, um, do I have enough of them? So I check for my tail tails, I check um, for my hiking straps to make sure that they're um, comfortable for me, um, the tiller extension. Um, and on the TCSE boats, these are adjustable and so somebody might have used the boat before you and adjusted them um, differently than you, but I, I always check those because if I start to sail out and I notice the tail tails are needing uh, some help, I just sail over to the, the, the dock and get some help. Um, sometimes I have a little set tape with me in my dry bag. But you can, you can just park your boat in the middle of the lake, um, put it in safety position and then climb up there and put on some more tape. But those are some of the things I do as I'm getting ready. Um, and then once you see they're starting to sit, set up the course, you might just sail the course um, and practice rough roundings to um, notice the wind on the lake for that moment. Um, so you're noticing where is it, where is it shifting? Um, where are the puffs? What else are you looking for when you're just messing around before the race starts, Jeff? Uh, Jeff? Uh, well, um, once the course is in, the the race committee has set the windward buoy i try to get a sense for the the good angles 
So, which will help me understand whether it's likely to be more starboard favored or more port favored. Um, and I use that language intentionally get a sense for because it's, it's at least in part a feeling. And it's not definite, of course, you know, you might, it might be starboard favored before the start, but then the wind goes left and it becomes port favored. So uh, and what's interesting in the rhythm of the wind, I would say. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is you might start to get a sense of that and then the race committee realizes it too and they put up the postponement flag and they adjust the course <laughs> and they're like oh okay well now i have to adjust again because they just shifted the start line over a little bit to make it more square and so um but it's okay you know it's it's um it, you're just kind of getting into that groove of being able to pick up where the wind is coming from and how it changes because because it does it shifts in 15 minute increment increments uh, yeah. well, so or even less i mean the oscillations can be two to four minutes even yeah. like five five degrees back and forth ten degrees even. not ten so um do we have any other ideas for your beginning of the race checklist any other questions I one thing I, <clears throat> I like to do to get a sense for that wind, sort of a, a technique for that, is um, sail a close hauled course for a long time, even if you think you're getting knocked down and not sailing the best course or something, still sailing that same port or starboard tack longer than you need to. You're not racing right now, you don't need to sail the best course. That gives you a really good sense of, you know, of those wind shifts and what's happening. Um, you know, sort of, I, I alternate between that and the, hey, I need to practice a bunch of tacks or jibes, then I'll go, okay, now I'm just gonna sail without tacking and jibing. I'm just gonna concentrate on what is the wind doing? Can I go fast when I want to? Yeah, what I find when I do that and I sail a really, really long close held course, I can see how it might be pushing me away from the mark. Whereas if I was racing, I would say, oh, I'm getting knocked. I should, um, tack at this point but i think i'm just going to stay here and see how long it pushes me you know pushes me down and, and away from the mark um or does it shift back and i get lifted a few minutes later what's really frustrating is when you think you're getting knocked and you tack and then it shifts again and it's like oh shoot i just got back john uh part of my checklist is to make sure that uh i tried to accelerate my boat uh, from nearly stopped to full speed. Uh, if, if I've done uh, my acceleration drills and checked my ability to make the boat go fast under the wind conditions that are there that day, light wind, medium wind, high wind, uh, that'll give me a better uh, start at the line. Okay, so we have um, um, Pat. Do you have anybody in the waiting room? Yeah, I don't know about this part of Zoom functionality. Ryan says he was kicked out and, and it's not letting him in without oh, he's coming. Without someone saying okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. There we go. Okay, Joe, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the fundamentals. Sure. Um, I'll stop sharing. sharing and let you share.
Great. Okay, everyone can see my screen, I hope. Oops. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, so the thought here was so Cynthia told me the topic was checklists and immediately what jumped to my mind are kind of the the basic uh, MC fundamentals like fast sailing fundamentals I'm calling them a bulleted list of things to think about it's a little bit different uh, interpretation of the checklist idea different than what we just did that said I think it fits and it definitely fits into the general idea that First, we need to be explicit about something, which is like writing it on a checklist. And then as we do it over and over again, it becomes a habit and then ultimately becomes automated. Um, so with that in mind, I thought we would cover some of the basic fast sailing fundamentals for the MC. Now, I do want to point out my comment here. Um, I'm pretty much, I mean, this is kind of common knowledge what I'm going to present and this has already been organized several times and I lifted a lot of this content not lifted but I, I used a lot of the content that uh, Henry Chestnut the former former LHYC racer put together for a salesing article so if you're interested in reading the article on salesing you can search his name and, and find uh, a lot of the same information presented in a little bit different format so with that let's jump into it excuse me, excuse me Joe what is salesing Ah, right. Salesing is a, the, the mission of salesing is to organize all skill building type information related to scout racing into one accessible free platform. And uh, salesing, S-A-I-L, Z as in zebra, I-N-G. And you can just search that on Google and you'll find salesing.com is put together by uh, a gentleman out of a lake in Wisconsin, Lake Beulah, Al Hager is his name. And he's very passionate and he's a, an older guy retired and he started sailing actually racing the MC as a retiree. And he's done really quite well, I think. He may have had a top 10 finish at nationals at some point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, speaking of top 10 at nationals, this picture is Bill Dreheim who uh, sails out of Rush Creek in, near Dallas. And I think he got maybe second last year at nationals and he won nationals the year before and he's had quite a run. Um, good sailor, really nice guy. He also does some, uh, he has an educational series called, called Talks with Bill or something. I don't know, he's involved with Quantum Sales, which is a sail maker. Um, so you can search his name too. If you're interested in his educational series, Bill, and then the last name is Dreheim, D-R-A-H-E-I-M. Uh, but I thought it was, it hey. was yeah. Flora, could somebody write that in the chat when they get a chance? Sure. For the spelling? I know you just spelled it, Joe, but I missed it. No, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> you can write it in the chat. Uh, Bill is the first name. The last name, I think it's D-R-A-E-H-E-I-M. But Yeah, that's right get you there that plus MC sailing yeah cool right so we see one two three four five six words on the screen boat heel rudder main sheet body placement a uh, simple bulleted list but these four things uh, are probably you know 80% of sailing fast in the boat and and if you're a newer racer um, or even an intermediate mid-fleet type racer focusing on automating, making your boat going to go fast using these things that we're about to talk about, focusing on that alone will dramatically improve your performance. Uh, you'll feel better about your sailing. You'll, you'll finish higher in the races. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I mean, this is what I did to, to try to get fast over the past two years to so just focus mainly on this stuff first. Right. Um, another thing I would call out before jumping into the details here, the way I would read these, boat heel is like my measuring stick. It, it kind of helps me know where I am in terms of how the boat is performing. 
rudder, main sheet, and body placement, I consider to be tools I use to maintain boat heel. The rudder, of course, is also your steering wheel. So like if you need to turn the boat, you would use that. But assuming you don't need to make a big turn, I can, the rudder is, is just a, a tool along with the other things to you to maintain the boat heel. So boat heel, what does it look like? 15 to 20 degrees, that's 15 to 20 degrees from a line that's directly up from the water, as you see in the picture to the lower right. Um, I like that picture in the top right. Uh, I like the language too. too. Too cold, too hot, just right. It, it's a common uh, kind of mistake for newer sailors where we think we're faster when we're healed up higher, which, which isn't really true. The water should never be coming over the side of your boat. Uh, if, you're, if it is, you need, you're overpowered. You need to find a way to decrease the power on the boat because, uh, because what happens, as you can see in the middle there in that top right picture where it says too hot, the board is not, you, the board needs to be vertical into the water, down into the water. And when it's not, it doesn't perform correctly. So this boat here, it, it seems like maybe it'd be going fast, close hauled. In fact, it's slipping to the side because this board is not performing under the water like it needs to. Okay. Um, one comment on that. So without getting too technical, we have this big airfoil here we call a sail. It's generating all of this lift in this direction. We use our board to translate that lift into forward motion and motion to windward. So the boat wants to be just kind of pushed over, tipped over by this, this heavy lifting force coming off the airfoil. The board allows us to translate that, this board here, into a lifting force to windward. That's called hydrodynamic lift versus aerodynamic lift. So if that board isn't completely vertical into the water, then it's not doing that job as effectively as it can. And one more thought about this. Think about the size difference between your sail on the MC and the board that is going down into the water. Even though they're vastly different sizes, they can balance each other essentially just due to how much more dense the water is than the air. So that's a little bit technical, but, but the main thing to keep in mind here is boat heel is I'll call it the number one factor for speed. It's very important. You have to keep your boat heel on that 15 to 20 degrees pretty much all the time. And we're thinking upwind sailing. You do need to heel your boat when going downwind, but uh, for the purpose of, of this conversation, thinking mostly about upwind sailing. I note here also wetted surface. That's true. I and mean, if your boat is too flat, you have more uh, surface area in the water, which just creates more drag. So. Get it to this just right point. Any thoughts about boat heel generally or questions? Yeah, I'm wondering, is there a way to practice getting it right, just right? When I'm in the boat, you can't, it's, I mean, since I'm newer, it's, it's a little harder to judge. Is there a tool? Is there like a, some kind of bubble float that's gonna, I can stick in the boat temporarily to give me a, uh, idea of where my angle's at till I get that down pat and get that feel for where I want it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think an easy thing you can do is if you're this person here on a starboard tack, you can take a look at the uh, front port uh, gunnel here right at the edge and monitor, you want the water line to be just maybe an inch below the edge of your boat on the leeward side. That's okay. the easiest, most accessible uh, tool to measure. Oh, that's a perfect measurement then. Okay. I like that. Yeah, it's right at that side stay, the shroud there. You can look and, and that's where the water will start coming up first. So it's easy to see as you're skippering an MC. Uh, okay. You mentioned that 
it's important on the downwind as well, but you didn't want to focus on that as much for this presentation. But I do want to mention for our newer racers, the folks who are not paying attention to healing the boat on the downwind are the ones who fall further and further behind. So they end up creating this huge gap between themselves and the, the boat right in front of them. And, um, and it may be very frustrating for them. And so it, it's important to try to remember to heal your boat at 15 degrees all the time. And um, when you're going, even when you're going downwind, but we'll let Joe go back to. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Cynthia. And I think, especially on the downwind, it's where this wetted surface comment comes into play. If you're flat on the downwind, you're just inducing extra drag for yourself. So if you need to sit on the low side in order to tip the boat up a little bit, then you should do that. Just be careful that your boom doesn't hit the water because that also creates a lot of drag. Yeah. So one more topic related to boat heel. Uh, this is a bit more of an advanced topic, but it is important and it's not so advanced that we can't think about it now. Uh, the topic is called hull steering, and you can this this uh, image here to the right is more focused on a centerboard dinghy. Um, the way I like to think of it is when going upwind, uh, if if you and you can practice this, if you overheal your boat a little bit, keeping everything else the same, the sail trim, the rudder position, uh, you'll notice that the boat will want to turn a little bit into the wind. So when it's, when it's overhealed a bit, it'll turn into the wind. And when it's flattened, it will actually turn away from the wind a little bit. And that's just related to uh, kind of the shape of the boat and, and what part of the, the surface area of the bottom of the boat is touching the water. That's what this is trying to say. When we're healed to starboard, wetted surface increases on the starboard side and it turns to port. Joe, a question? Yes. Is this the same thing people mean when they talk about weather helm? Uh, definitely related. Yeah, weather helm it can be defined as the pressure you feel on your tiller where the boat wants to turn up into the wind. And yeah, it's the same feeling and the same forces will be at play. Some of the same forces. So just to Thanks, reiterate, Joe. in effect, what you're saying is getting that heel just right is going to reduce the amount of um, steering into or away from the wind that your boat's going to naturally do. Yes. That's, okay. um, and they're useful tools. I mean, sometimes you can, you can encourage your boat to go closer to the wind um, without without making drastic changes in other things like your sail trim or, and you can do that with your body position. So if I'm oh, okay. sitting and it's at a good heel and I want to allow the boat to head up a little bit, I can just lean my body in a little bit. I overheal just slightly and the body and the boat wants to come up into the wind. Okay. So the next topic is our rudder. Uh, the rudder is our steering, steering wheel. We all know that. It's how we turn the boat. Um, and that's true. And you have to make turns on the race course to go around marks, to, to go through a tack, to do a jibe. And yes, you use your rudder, um, but it also can be somewhat of a break. So we need to be careful with our rudder because look at this, you know, people say, it's a barn door, you'll hear people say this. It's pretty big. For how small our boat is, our rudder is pretty big. So if you turn this all the way to the side, you're, it's like dragging your foot in the water. So the goal with the rudder when you're not actually steering is neutral. So someone mentioned weather helm previously. You want to do everything you can with the other tools at your disposal to maintain heel and minimize rudder. And we'll talk about those two tools, primary tools, next. Thoughts on rudder usage? 
Can you, yeah, can you actually just say why you want to minimize rudder a little bit? Uh, because it induces drag. I mean, if you're, if you're fighting your, uh, like if you have a lot of weather helm or any time that you work hard physically to keep the rudder in the same position uh, means that what well, people will say the boat is out of balance, which means like you have too much power being generated by your sail or your boat heel isn't correct. Something else needs to be corrected in order to, to, take the force off the rudder because that force you're feeling is drag. It's, it's slowing you down. Right. And I'd like to add to that. Um, a mistake that often uh, new racers will make is the, the jiggly rudder. They're moving their rudder so often and so frequently that they're, it's like they're, they're tapping the brakes on their, on your car as you're also trying to accelerate. So, it, anytime you're, you're moving the tiller too fast or too far or too often, you're, you're creating uh, the tapping the brake effect on your boat. You're, slow, you're, you're slowing down. It doesn't, it, it, it's an apparent that you're doing it, but you pay attention to how often you're, you're touching the tiller and moving it and don't jiggle uh, the rudder. Yeah, saw the rudder, you hear people say, moving back and forth. Um, and I, I think you mentioned before, uh, looking behind you at the trail that your rudder is making in the water can really help you um, notice when you're making it uh, sort of an S shape um, or if you're making a straight line. Um, so it, it doesn't take much to just glance behind you and see what kind of trail you're making in the water. Yeah. Someone told me once that your goal should be to to hold your tiller extension in your hand with this like very soft like barely holding it. i mean sometimes i'll just be like grasping it with my fingertips making sure i don't let it go but but when the boat is balanced and the helm is neutral you could like lay that tiller extension in the palm of your hand while you're sailing and and it, it, the boat wouldn't turn up into the wind To what's in your other hand, the main sheet. The main sheet is a sail control. We think of sail controls being the Vang and the Cunningham and the Outhaul, and maybe they're a little bit complex. We don't know what they do. They're micro adjustments compared to the main sheet. The main sheet is your primary sail control. Uh, it's, it's what's in your hand almost the entire time. Okay. Um, it, it's true that we think of, uh, you know, close haul, close reach, beam reach, broad reach, run and, and sail positions. And, you know, there's always an ideal angle of the sail for whatever wind. And that's true, I would say. Um, but I, it, you should make small adjustments. That's what I'm trying to say. Like seek that ideal, but, but don't get wrapped up in trying to find you know, these like single position points for, for how you're pointing relative to the wind. Instead, uh, try to develop a, a feeling for it and make small adjustments. Like a lot of times, when you, let's say you're sailing up wind and you're able to get it into a, a nice close haul position. Your sail is maybe eight to 12 inches from the blocks here and it's good. When you need to make an adjustment because of a small wind increase or decrease, a lot of times that adjustment is less than six inches, a little bit in, a little bit out, and you're constantly playing it. It's not a something where you have discrete positions that you go to. And you know it, that this develops over time, and it's okay to think of them as somewhat discrete positions, but as you do it more and more, you'll realize that's much more of a continuum and you, sh you can make very small adjustments and you're constantly adjusting the main sheet, playing it often. And that leads me to my next point. Use your main sheet to depower the boat. That's what this is saying here. This sailor is fighting the rudder. They're hiked way out, they're uncomfortable. You know, the abs are hurting, the legs are hurting. They're not paying attention to what's around them. Plus, look at all of this weather helm. They're really fighting the helm here. They're overpowered. 
They just need to drop some of that power from, from the sail. And it could be up to, you know, a whole foot that they let out. And if they were to ease the main, the boat would come back to a balance point. It would stop being overheeled. It would, the uh, helm would go back to more of a neutral position. They can then comfortably hike out and maybe slowly ease the main back in to uh, head back up a little bit, to uh, generate a little bit more power and force, but doing it in a controlled manner. This, this is physically exerting, and it's an inefficient use of energy, and it's taking this person's mind away from what they should be focused on, and the boat is side-slipping. The, the uh, board is not at a, in, a, in a vertical position into the water, so the boat is just slipping off to the uh, to port here. Thoughts about the main sheet? Well, on, on the TCSC boats, um, many people will notice that there is a set of cleats where you could cleat the main sheet, but we sometimes tape those up to discourage people from um, cleating your main sheet because on our MCs, we really don't want to be cleating the main sheet ever. You want to be adjusting all the time and be ready to adjust all the time. Um, so uh, that it, it, it's part of the boat design that there is a cleat there, but we don't use it for cleating the main sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, some people do cleat the main. Um, like Andy Crow, a very accomplished sailor on our lake is quite good at cleaning the main um, and then controlling the boat. But the point there is he understands how to use the rudder and his body weight and the sail controls like the bang well enough that he can keep the boat under control without having to, to easily play the main sheet. And um, it can be, especially in heavy wind, it can be very physically demanding to be holding that main sheet and, and moving it in and out a lot when going up wind. So uh, for that reason also, people will cleat the main. I, I'm fortunate enough to have the strength to be able to play it uh, a lot anyway. So, you know, I tried, that's what I do, but um, understanding that everyone is different physically that, you know, we, you should play the main as much as you can, I would say. And if it's too heavy for you to be able to do that, maybe it's time to get crew. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I would say the, the one summarizing point here on the main sheet is use it a lot. Yeah, I mean, you need, you need to be constantly adjusting your main sheet more than anything else, probably. Um, and smooth movements, not jerky movements, because the, the power off of your sail is generated from a, a connected flow across the backside. The air is rushing, rushing past this sail in a, the word that's used is laminar, in a laminar flow, a connected flow. And that's what generates the uh, high pressure, low pressure system that we call lift. And that leads me to the last tool. So we talked about boat heel, and then we talked about maintaining that boat heel while min minimizing uh, unnecessary rudder movements. We talked about how the main sheet is your primary tool to, to control your boat heel if you're overheeled let out some of the main. It's not going to slow you down. In fact, it'll speed you up. The other main tool is you. Your body placement is what I'm calling your free variable on the boat. It's the only thing on the boat that can be in kind of any position. Everything else is controlled by the, by the uh, kind of structure of the boat system. Um, so use your body. Um, but as much as you can, use it smoothly. And this improves over time. Everyone, when they start, it's unnatural. How do I pass the tiller behind my back? Where do I sit? I'm clunky, I'm tripping over things. That's normal, totally normal. But as you do this more and you focus on it, you can become very smooth and intentional with your body movements. Um, similar to, I was discussing how with the main sheet when I started, my movements were rough and, and bigger and kind of discreet. Same thing with my body. I was either hiked out or I was sitting on the rail or I was in. You know, like those three 
positions. Um, now that I've been doing this a while though, I, I think of it much more on a continuum. I'm tied up against the traveler almost all the time, but as far as how far my body moves away from the center line of the boat, that's, that, it's kind of a continuum for me. Um, and, and I don't wanna to move too much. You don't want your body placement to be a distraction. So that's why the main sheet is your number one tool to, to control, to depower when you're overpowered or to control your boat heel. And if you think that you can just like keep that main sheet tight and, and hike the boat down really hard, okay, you might be able to, but what are you missing out by doing that? You're expending a lot of energy, you're taking your focus away from other things, and you're probably not being very effective about it because that, you know, moving your weight out just a little bit is much less efficient than just letting the main sheet out 12 inches until your boat comes back to an appropriate heel, and then you can adjust your body smoothly and calmly, and then ease your main sheet back in. So I put a picture of the cat. That's something that Ryan says all the time. Ryan Grosh, very accomplished racer on our lake, will say, uh, move like a cat in the boat. Yeah, this is Ryan here. Yeah, so yeah, one, one thing people don't, or a lot, I see a lot of beginners do, is they try to like sail a sailboat, like they drive a car. Like you drive a car by just like sitting in one place and you don't move your body much. But in sailing, you're actually moving your body a lot around the boat. And so you see beginners, like, they just won't be moving around the boat. Um, so, yeah. So if you have, if you move your body to, like, the low side of the boat, and you can, like, heel up your boat more, and then uh, your boat will want to naturally turn into the wind more. So you can steer your boat with your body placement and then you can uh, flatten your boat more to steer down and then same thing Joe talked about the sail uh, if you let out your sail more then that's going to help your boat turn away from the wind and if you pull in your sail more that'll help your boat turn into the wind uh, so that's one thing Joe talked about like not moving your rudder a lot so you want to try to think about how you can steer with your uh, sails or your body before you start to steer with your rudder. Yeah. That, that was helpful to me. That was the question I had. Um, if boat heel is your primary objective, then within that, you've got main sheet, then body, then rudder. Is that what I understood? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Fair way to think about it. I would. I, I would put main sheet and body as number one, and then rudder as number two. Yeah, uh, I mean, they're both very important. I, I would agree. I think. I think that, I guess my point about putting the main sheet in front of the body was just that if you're trying to depower the boat, you need to, you, you just need to ease the sail a little bit. If it has to happen quickly, you need to ease the sail. But, but um, to Ryan's point, both are, are equally important holistically in how we uh, help to steer the boat without having to use uh, heavy rudder movements. No, I get that. And as a beginner, um, you know, my inclination is going to be to go to the main sheet before my body because I'm thinking that's going to be faster <laughs> if I need a fast adjustment. Yeah. Well, we all, or many of us know what it feels like to have the MC almost tip over or tip over. And if the boat's about to tip over, you definitely release the main. You don't like try to stick your whole body out the other side. So, so yeah, it's a much faster adjustment point. Thank you. I remember the um, the speaker we had a few years ago. Um, from, I'm going to forget his name, but so anybody can chime in <laughs> when they remember his name. But um, he he had was a college coach and uh, of racing, and 
he talked about um, having your body position um, nice and tight. So sitting right up close to the traveler, your legs together, your arms close to your torso, your hands in that boxer position um, so that you could, when you had your body nice and tight, then in your center of gravity was right there in your butt on the edge of the, the boat that it would freed you up to be able to look around without losing your balance. Um, and if you looked around, you would, not, you wouldn't be shifting your boat by your body movement. You could just use your upper torso to look around for other boats or look up at your sail. Um, and um, so I've, I've tried to remember that when I'm in the boat is have good body placement and position so that, um, uh, my, my body movements are not going to shift the boat. Yeah, Cynthia, I think that is a really great point. Um, when, I'm, when I'm in my boat, I try uh, three things I so remind myself are uh, keep, it, keep the body tight, like you said. So like kind of knee, elbows in if you can and kind of knees close together and ankles close together. And... I uh, have to remind myself sometimes never to cross arms or legs. Sometimes I'll want to like put my legs, like kind of cross my legs underneath me or something, which may be comfortable until you have to move quickly and then you get caught up in things. So keep, keep elbows and knees together, keep your legs uncrossed and then kind of sit upright. That's the other thing I do. I just want to add on body placement. Uh, don't forget that the MC weighs about 420 pounds. So your body weight is huge relative to the boat. Yeah. Yeah, close to a third of it. I mean, between a quarter and a third, depending on how big you are. Yeah. Or half. Half, yeah, <laughs> my math is off. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, I mean, I think we've we've talked about this throughout the whole presentation. So these elements in practice, we want to maintain our heel, and uh, we use our body and our main sheet to help steer the boat without having to use the rudder. We talked about a kind of calm, centered position of our body close to the traveler. Uh, moving on a continuum, moving smoothly. The last thing I wanted to highlight, and we've hit all the points related to this, but you'll hear people say this, ease, hike, trim, E-H-T. And, and that just means that when, uh, say, the puff comes on, when there's a little bit more wind, when you feel overpowered, the first thing you do is ease the sail a bit in order to get back to your, your ideal boat heel. And then you use your body to uh, counteract that healing force by hiking more, which allows you to bring the sail back in and uh, you know, make the boat more efficient for that slightly higher wind speed. That's, where that, uh, that's what that means. You'll hear people saying that around the lake, ease, hike, trim. And it's mostly in response to increased wind speed when sailing upwind. So when the boat feels overpowered, here's what you can do. Yeah. Um, we took questions throughout. Does anyone have any closing thoughts or questions or comments on the topic of uh, MC fast sailing fundamentals? Yeah, Joe, one question. Um, it's, this is like really great information and stuff, but it seems like a lot to absorb in that it seems like you'd practice a little bit and then maybe be ready for like the next thing and then practice a little more and be ready for sure. the next thing. How does that tend to work in practice? I would, well, um, I, I would think about boat heel first. So whatever you can do to heal the boat. Sometimes you have to use your body to, to move to the low side in order to heal the boat. Um, yeah, and once and and then just move the main sheet a lot. That's the other thing I would do is like get a sense of of what it feels like when the main sheet is out when you're sailing up when the out main sheet is out two feet versus out a foot and a half versus in about to about a foot. And when I say out a foot or out two feet, I mean the distance between 
the block that is connected to the traveler and the block that is connected to the boom. Yeah, cool. Okay, that helps. So it sounds like your your first goal is to kind of get a feel for how much power you're really applying to the boat and how it affects yes, the deal. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So um, another another great approach, one that uh, we try if we have enough time and daylight during uh, racing practice is to go out on uh, and like on a starboard tack from low on the lake, we'll just stay on starboard tack as long as possible. And during, uh, while we're on that close hauled course, notice what is the boat doing? What, are, what is the wind doing? And trying to maintain optimum speed and looking at what's the heel of the boat doing? How can I maintain the proper heel close hauled as fast as possible on this particular course? Just doing that practice, um, you know, for 20, 30 minutes uh, while you're out on the lake really helps your attention to detail and monitoring uh, proper, proper heel on a close held course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, to add to that, so it's, it's really helpful if you have like, one other boat um, to compare yourself to. Um, so then you can see like, okay, they're like going the same way as me. And you know, they're relatively close to me in the same wind, but they're going faster. Then you can look over at them and kind of compare yourself to them and ask yourself, okay, what are they doing differently? That's making them going faster like which of these things that we talked about today are they doing that you're not doing what you mean we're not going to be the fastest boat in our first race we go into <laughs> yeah, you can do that in a things have happened joe <laughs> <laughs> you can do that in a race or just like ask someone to go sailing on um some day or night cool thanks yeah. Often that happens a lot as well before races is a good time for that. Um, that's another reason to get out to the race early is that's a great time to practice. After the race, folks are usually a little dehydrated and, e and eager to get in. So put, put the extra time ahead of the race instead of after. Yeah. I, I have a question um, for Ryan and, and for Joe and the group. Um, this is the scenario uh, after uh, going down the lake on a downwind run and you round the, the leeward mark and you're going upwind. I'm wondering uh, what is it, what are the questions that you end up having and the questions that you're asking and resolving as far as when is it that you're going to use the rudder to go to the the closest hauled course you can get and then moving up the lake to get closer to your new windward mark like uh you know we don't want to drag the, the rudder um but you do have to get as close as you can to the wind at the same time so do you mean do you mean right as you come around the mark or, or after you've established a close hauled course? Yeah, after you've established a close hauled course, uh, when is it that you're going to use the rudder to get close? I mean, I think that, I think as I come around the mark, I mean, certainly you're using the rudder to steer yourself around the mark. Um, but once you achieve uh, about a close hauled course, from there, I'm, I'm trying to minimize rudder movements. And, and if I want to get closer to the wind, that's mostly, um, that's mostly about building up a little bit of speed by heading a little bit lower, having your sail out a little bit more than you would, and then slowly easing the sail in, balancing that extra force with your body weight, and you can kind of creep up closer to the wind. But I would say for me, as soon as I complete that turn, I'm into the mode of, of use my body and the sails to steer.
Thank you, Joe. So we have uh, about 19 minutes left in our scheduled time. And we did plan a break. I think we can go through, this was the most important topic I wanted to cover, I think, and, and the one best suited for um, the, our audience today, the one we already covered. I did have another topic and uh, I'd like to go through it just a little bit quickly and we'll send out the slides for anyone who's interested. Um, but people do need a bit of a break. So I think maybe just like 90 seconds, I'll start up again. So everyone get up and stretch. I'll do that myself too. I like this break idea. Maybe I'll propose it at our work meetings. Wonder how that will go over. Oh, I thought he was going to play this video. Let me see if I can. I decided not to. Oh. As long. Oh, yes, yeah, three minutes. Anyway, just for your reference, that video is the one that was the Olympic sailing competition with the Irish commentator who didn't know anything about <laughs> racing, which is hilarious. And it might not be as funny to people who don't know anything about racing, but if you know something about racing, you can realize that this commentator does not know what he's talking about. <laughs> it's very funny. So with just a bit of time left, um, I want to go through is this next topic. Um, this is something I also found on Salesing that I thought was really quite cool. The article is, is pretty short um, and I included a link here down at the bottom and it'll be in the slide deck, which we'll share with everyone. It's called the Sailing Cycle. And I think it's the brainchild of this guy. I've never met this guy, but uh, you know, seems like a nice person. I'm sure I'll see him in Nationals or something sometime. Uh, he lives on the East Coast. His name's Zach Clayton. He, he's an IOYA champ, two-time Nationals runner-up. This was uh, all in, I think, about the last decade. Um, he's been a sailmaker his entire career and also a sailing coach. So his concept was, he calls the sailing cycle, and it's mostly about managing your thinking while in a race. And he, he looks pretty fast here. Might be a tiny bit overheeled, but looks pretty good. And you can notice that his... his uh, his main sheet seems to be out just a little bit, so he's controlling his boat heel with his main sheet. Right, so the sailing cycle, managing your thought process, happens to all of us, wandering thoughts. Uh, this model is intended to help you consolidate and retain focus while in a sailboat race. And if you do it enough, you can develop um, we can develop, thinking of checklists, we can develop automation not just related to what I do before the start, what I do before I get to the race, what I do before I round a windward mark, you know, ease the bank, what I do to get my boat to go fast, like uh, ease the main, hike out, trim back in, like we, what we were just talking about. This is that same concept, but this is how can I keep myself engaged with the race and, and be as fully present and focused on what I'm doing right now as possible. So here it is. And he said when he teaches it that it's kind of a 15 second thing. I, you know, it may not be a perfect model because it's not like our brain works this way. One, two, three, four, five, six. But it's a nice kind of baseline. Like these are all the things we need to think about. What's my boat doing, angle of heel, sail trim, also maybe body placement. What's the wind doing? Am I on the favored tack or jibe, which uh, very simply means uh, is the starboard pointing me closer to the windward mark or is the port po pointing me closer to the windward mark? Is there a breeze up the course? Uh, are there puffs, dead spots? What are the positions? 
and then who's immediately around me. And around and around in a cycle, these are all the things we can be thinking about while racing. So I'm, I'm breaking it down now just a little bit. So that's what I said, yeah, what is my boat telling me? Where is the wind? Where's the, where are the marks and the fleet? And what is my position relative to them? And then what boats are immediately around me? So to go just a little bit deeper, the, the boat, angle of heel and sail trim. These are the same things we've been talking about. Angle of heel is our measuring stick. Sail trim can be, we can think of as main sheet. I mean, there, there, yes, there are other controls, but, but for the primary um, for beginning purpose and, and really even for advanced people, the, the main sheet is your most fast and powerful sail control and way of adjusting sail trim. So what's the boat doing? That's the, the first part of this sailing cycle, this mental kind of cycle of things I'm going through. What's the boat doing? I mentioned this a little bit, thinking first, this, this is very explicit, very uh, step, 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 step. You know, eventually though, we, we have patterns of thought that can develop and that's where we see automation. And you'll hear this described in, uh, in, in kind of fun, old timey lingo that lifelong sailors will say like, oh, you know, how do you know when your boat's going fast? Oh, I just feel it in my butt. I, I feel it is what you'll hear in, in various formats when you ask a lot of people how they know their boat is going fast. They'll say they feel it. And that is true because they have developed this automation. But um, the things we've talked about today are some tools to help us develop, uh, get to the point where we can tell if our boat is going fast or our boat is going slow or do we need to ease the main or we need to apply more bang or we need to hike harder. Um, all, eventually all of that can become a feeling, can become, oh, I just feel it in my butt, right? One thing I pointed out uh, earlier, maybe missing from the model, maybe not, maybe it's included here, but to control our angle of heel, we have not only sail trim, but we also have our body placement, like we talked about before. So the first two parts of this cycle are, are all about the boat, all about the feeling of going fast and kind of inside the boat, what can I do or what should I be thinking about or responding to? Uh, I would also mention that every single one of these things, these are kind of information inputs you you if you notice that you're overhealed and you notice that your sail is in really tight you would then make adjustments in order to achieve that kind of sense of equilibrium that was discussed that uh, angle of heel that maintains a vertical board in the water so the next section is all about the wind uh, where is the wind? What is the favorite tack and jibe? Am I on a good angle to the mark? If I'm somewhere mid course on a starboard tack, marks up here and I'm kind of going like this, maybe that's a better course than being on a port tack, which is lead, leading me farther away from the mark. So it's, it can be a complex topic because the wind likes to go back and forth. So we think of when people say favor, tack, or jibe, it's usually relative to is the wind over on the right or is the wind over on the left. But in simple language, am I on the tack that is pointing me closer to the mark than the other tack or jibe? And then the other, the next one is breeze up the course. So uh, ahead of me or behind me, if I'm going downwind, uh, is there wind? Do I see puffs? Do I see dead patches? Does it look stronger, weaker? And might that information cause me to change uh, my approach on, on how I'm going to go towards the mark? If there's a puff, no, normally we don't recommend, people don't recommend chasing puffs on the upwind, but, um, but a dead patch on the upwind, if it's light wind and there's this big dead patch, you can see it, it looks glassy in front of you, maybe you should consider not sailing directly into it, even if it might be the favored tack at that time. The next section is all about positions. Uh, 
uh, position of the mark relative to me. Um, so back to favored tax, say we're going upwind and we're, we're not, we're early in the leg, uh, the mark is way over there. So I'm using the position of the mark primarily to understand am I on the, the better tack or uh, kind of where I want to go. Um, another point though is where is the fleet? We're not sailing alone and sailboat racing isn't like a time trial where you are sailing just by yourself around the mark and then the next person goes. No, we sail all at the same time. Um, so there is an element of risk management associated with your fleet position that we should consider uh, more of an advanced topic, but, but still important to, uh, to think about. If, if the fleet is way off to the right over here, mark is in the middle, fleet is way over here, and I'm way off to the left, I'm in a very risky position. I mean, yes, the wind might go left, in which case I would have advantages over the people over here. Uh, but, you know, that's quite a gamble. So you need to, as an information input, as part of the sailing cycle, the position of the fleet is important. And this rule applies, or, or these thoughts related to this topic apply for small fleets, say, you know, there are only eight or 10 of us out on a weekend race, or we have much bigger fleets sometimes on Lake Harriet, up to 30 boats, or at the National Regatta, where there are 100 boats. Um, always the position of the fleet is an important piece of information that goes into our decision making about uh, where we want to go on the course. If we're way over to the left, and the fleet is more to the right, we need to make, we might be more inclined to sail a port tack to get closer to the fleet if we find ourselves in, our, in a risky position. So we might like take a puff to try to get closer to the fleet. And I, I just want to add in here um, an anecdote um, that relates to the breeze up the course as well as this portion. Um, that sometimes the rest of the fleet might go in a certain direction and you might think, think oh, well, that's gonna be the better side of the course because that's where Ryan Grosh is and so I'm gonna follow him. And yet you're so far back, like I was one time, uh, that the wind has changed. And so I'm looking up the course and I'm thinking, wait a second, when they were in my position, the, it might have looked like the left side was favored, but now it looks like if I just head straight to the mark, I'm going to be okay. And um, one time that's what happened. And I ended up, you know, getting to the mark right behind Ryan. And, you know, there were nine boats behind me that nice. <laughs> had gone over to the other side with Ryan because they were really close to him. Um, but I got lifted and I was lucky because I was looking at the breeze up the course and, um, and adjusting my, my strategy based on what I could see that I was dealing with being way back in 11th place. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So the last one is part of this model uh, is, uh, he has it listed as boat to boat. I, I label it as tactical considerations, but um, We've, we've paid attention to where the fleet overall is, but of course we need to pay close attention to the boats that are immediately around our boat. Uh, we want to avoid, avoid collision, of course, that's in our rule set. It's very important to maintain safety and prevent any sort of uh, property damage, et cetera. Um, so think about boats that are crossing, that are on different tacks, uh, maybe the port boat is coming across where the starboard boat and we need to be mindful of if they're going to say tack here or go below us and we should even communicate with them. We should definitely communicate with them. Um, also, we need to pay attention to boats that are to windward of us. If we're going this way, the boat that's over here is to windward of us and there is a, uh, a boat close to you changes the way the wind interacts with your boat, uh, something called a, a wind shadow. So we need to pay attention to boats that are to windward of us and also to leeward of us. There's a, there's a wind shadow off of your windward side of the boat as well. There's the kind of blanket effect that comes from your sail, but there's also a smaller wind shadow that comes off the, the windward side of your boat. So we need to pay attention to the boats that are to leeward of us as well. 
um, for wind shadow, and then also for uh, you know what they're going to do. Perhaps they're going to tack in front of you, and and they're going to make it, or or if you're going the other way, they're going to tack in front of you, and you have to avoid them. Um, so always important as part of the cycle to be paying attention to the boats that are very close to us. I call them kind of special focus points. You know, you you have a plan. You're making your boat go fast. You're on the favored tack or jive. You're sailing to, in the breeze. You're, you're positioning yourself on the course according to what you think the wind is going to do and according to where uh, the fleet is. But, you know, all strategies can be directly impacted or prevented um, by these boats that are immediately around you. So you'll hear people talk sometimes that if you can, you, you should really just try to avoid close contact with other boats as much as possible. It's going to be impossible, clearly, at the start and at mark roundings and, and at such, but um, not only for avoiding you know, rule conflict on the course, which of course we want to do, but but just in general, like it's your goal to sail the course as fast as possible. And yeah, you want to finish ahead of the people uh, because it's a race, but getting into close situations with other boats, it j just generally detracts from your ability to sail the course very quickly. So the last slide I have here is just kind of a, a connecting point. So this model, I think, can be a useful tool. Um, one, because it it kind of lays out a lot of the boat speed, strategy, tactics, and kind of puts it all in one place. But I think it's more useful, instead of being an exhaustive set of things that I need to think about, it's more interesting to me and more useful, I think, as just a a uh, kind of a mantra almost while I'm sailing. If I can keep my mind focused on what I'm doing, I'm much more likely to be happy, to be engaged, and to see better performance. You know, a lot of times we'll see that uh, maybe one thing is is keeping someone focused, or so other things that uh, they should be thinking about fall apart, or or thoughts from our life creep in. Did I send that email? Uh, you know, what is what's the Tiger King going to do on the next episode? <laughs> um, or you know, feelings. Feelings can be huge. Feelings can be useful. Feelings can also be big distractions, and they can consume us. We can. We can doubt our ability and the conditions. We can doubt, you know, whether we really want to be here. We can be anxious about, um, you know, these kind of the, the heavy forces associated with these crafts that we're, in, we're uh, playing around in very close to one another. Uh, or we could be anxious about our performance. I, I really messed up that tack and now I'm upset at myself so I can't get over it. Um, so with those things in mind, I think that this model is an interesting interesting thing to think about because it's it's just something that we can return to when we notice that we have strayed uh, i'm i'm borrowing a little bit from the language of mindfulness and meditation but um when when one meditates uh some of the guidance is is you're trying to let your thoughts pass by you as if they were cars on a highway and you were sitting in a chair and sometimes you stop cars and sometimes you chase cars. And when you notice that you're doing this, you, you kind of calmly just go back to your chair in this meditation model without judgment, without being too concerned about the content or, or you know, beating yourself up about it. And in that way, I think this model can be an interesting tool. It can be that baseline that we return to when we notice that our thoughts are strayed. Yeah. Um, what do y'all think? Interesting? Absolutely. Very interesting. Yeah. Is, Helpful. Yeah, this is Ryan. So I'd say this sailing cycle thinking is really good if you're a, like a intermediate racer. So what I'd recommend for beginners before you try to think about these, what there's, there's seven things. If you're like a true beginner, this is your first race. I'd recommend thinking about the boat speed things we talk about today. 
and try to look at the boats closest to you and just figure out how to like go as fast as them in a straight line. Um, like what are they doing differently if this is your like first race? And then once you figure out that, okay, I, your boat speed is pretty good and you can go as fast as other people in a straight line, then I'd, I'd recommend start to think, start thinking about these uh, seven things. Yeah, I agree fully with what Ryan said. And, and I think I mentioned even at the beginning of the uh, session today is that those, those simple boat speed things we talked about, like maintaining heel with the use of your body and your sails uh, and minimizing, trying to achieve a neutral helm, uh, that alone will, if, if all of us focused on, I mean, may, probably with the exception of Ryan, you know, if all of us focused only on those things this whole season, we would all see dramatic improvement and probably uh, increased satisfaction with our sailing as well. Uh, yeah, just to head on to that, I would say, yeah, I agree. I mean, my thought was this is a very nuanced um, way of thinking about it, which it is helpful to know, but yeah, as a beginner, I, I don't aspire to even be able to do that. I'm like, not capsizing is not on this list. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's true. That's so true. that's that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. I think uh, I to build on to that. So I, I really like this, and this is you know I'm gonna come back to this. But um, previously I've been using just a model of a much simplified version of this, which yeah is is sort of getting around the course is is a, a good level to be worried about first. But then just keeping my thoughts inside the boat versus outside the boat. I certainly notice that as the race goes on, you know I'll start either letting my thoughts just getting either inside the boat worrying about little things something broken or whatever or outside the boat outside of the lake but just sort of my simplified version of this uh circle is you know okay is the boat doing well okay is the lake you know okay things outside the boat are those doing well you know is sort of my simplified version of this that that i've been working with mm. joe ranke i really I really like the uh, the presentation. This is awesome. Um, I can see myself coming back to this several times throughout the the season or for each race. Um, I'm I'm seeing it from the point of view of uh, a new racer as moving the the sailing cycle to the boat moving fast cycle. You can focus on different aspects of your sail trim, your body position, rudder movement, where where you started and kind of thinking about what am I doing about those things um, every three or four minutes or, or frequently to get the boat to move fast. But th this was a great presentation, really liked it. I like that idea, John. I think, so kind of envisioning the, the, fun, the kind of basic fundamental topics we talked about in this same model format. Yeah. Um, all right. So I don't know, I, I already kind of said my piece, but I have this like nice, nice way to end here. Just saying that sailboat racing is a lifelong journey. Um, we have such an amazing setup on Lake Harriet here. It's, it's really a unique thing, the way our two clubs um, increase the access to sailing, uh, uh, um, encourage adults to begin racing. And we probably have more, you know, beginner adult racers than, than you know, probably anywhere else in the region, you know, and, and on the list of top 10 in the country, I bet, uh, for just the way that we can generate interest, um, newbie interest in, in adult racing, which is really something that we should not uh, take for granted and we should grow. And, and, and the last thing I said there is, the things we learned today may not make sense until tomorrow. Uh, this came from a comment that Cynthia made to me, I think, uh, she said Bill Colburn asked her one day before a race, hey, Cynthia, you know, hey, how's it going? What's your plan? What's your plan for the race? And she said, plan? What do you mean? Like, my boat is upright and going fast, and I'm happy with that. What do you mean, plan? Um, but then she got, she told me, she told me this, that uh, she got to thinking about it later and, and like, oh, yeah, maybe I should have a plan. So, um, so I think it's important sometimes that, that people are – 
given access to information that is knowingly a bit out of their reach because it allows us to kind of see what's ahead and, and kind of reach up for the sun and grow. So things we learn today may not make sense until tomorrow. Well, and things you're not thinking about, like I have ADHD and if I don't have a cycle to put my mind on, like it will go to places that would possibly make me a more dangerous sailor. And you know what I mean? Like I need patterns. And so it, it may not be advanced for me that I need a, a cycle to, to give my mind something to do. So I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it. Awesome. Well, you know, thank you, Joe. I agree with John. This has been a great presentation and, um, I know most of our folks here are new racers. We have some returning racers as well. But the, um, the point is that we do these seminars to refresh our, our knowledge about racing and to maybe hear again something we heard before, but the first time we heard it didn't really sink in. But now I'm hearing it and it's making more sense now. And maybe I can apply it or I can apply it better. Um, and so that's why we continue to keep coming back to these um, these racing topics before the season to refresh our brains after a long winter. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you for uh, the invitation to present today. I've had a lot of fun putting it together and communicating with all of you today. So thank you so much. Appreciate hey, Cynthia, it. I've got I've got a question, Cynthia. What's uh, what's next now for our training, and what kind of what's going to happen going forward? Good question. So, um, Ryan, you, I heard that you were interested in continuing these conversations. Did you want to say something about that? Yeah, I think uh, we should do the same time uh, uh, next week, and I mean. I, I can put something together, um, or I can see if, if Natalie Sin can do something. Um, I didn't ask her about specifically next Saturday, but she said uh, she'd be willing to present. Lovely. Um, there's so much about actual boats on the water in the beginning of the racing season. We might not know for sure for a week or two weeks or three weeks. So I'm all in favor of continuing these conversations. Natalie Sin is a really awesome racer who uh, was a member of Twin City Sailing Club for one year. Um, I think she purchased a boat in this sailing on Lake Minnetonka now. Um, and um, so it would be really fun to have her come back to talk to us again. And of course, we'd love to have you, uh, Ryan. Um, if you, all those, some of you might not know that Ryan uh, was also a member of Twin City Sailing Club once upon a time. And then when he bought his boat, he joined the Carrot Yacht Club. But he um, raced in college and, and was right away um, a, a top racer on our lake and um, giving Bill Colburn a run for his money at every time he came out there. So um, it's really nice to have Ryan out there um, racing with us each each race and uh, appreciate you sharing your expertise with us um, in these coaching sessions and um, seminars. Uh, question, so should we plan on this time frame next week with the content to be determined later? Yes. Okay, I will set that up. Thank you so much, Pat. John, you got a question? My pleasure. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get the host's attention. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> she, she lives in my house. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Joel, you had a good question, which is what next? Um, I'm so happy that Ryan and uh, other members of our group are interested to continue uh, virtually uh, these conversations about racing. What's it all about? How to be a racer? How to become a better racer? Today, I learned a lot. Um, as far as the practical uh, question of do we get to sail, do we get to race, um, let me fill you in on a few insider bits of information. Uh, we to, Twin Cities had our, our board meeting on Monday and we discussed uh, what are we going to do for uh, getting our boats on the water. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, we have discontinued or canceled indefinitely uh, new members joining our club. 
and we are planning to launch the fleet um, as more information becomes available as the buoys get on the water and when the park board lets us know that we can uh, actually put uh, launch boats and put them on buoys but we're we're going to try and get the fleet on the water uh, once the buoys are accessible probably um, at the end of May um, or or sooner but end of May early June at the latest I'm is my guess um, we're going to do that with uh, a, a limited number of volunteers that uh, are focused on safely launch uh, rigging the boats and getting them on the water without coming into contact with others. Um, I'm helping to coordinate that with a number of other people. Um, that's a work in progress. Uh, another very important part of it is what the Yacht Club will decide and establish as far as uh, what they want to do with having a race in a, in a safe environment with, uh, normally we have lake safety with uh, the the race officer's boat and, and two safety boats and the Yacht Club is still working on how that will play out uh, in our COVID environment. So um, overall, Joel, I'm, I'm gonna guess that maybe there might be some kind of racing on the lake sometime in late May, probably more like early June, but that's just, that's just my personal guesstimate. That's cool, John, thanks. I had two questions. Um, one, I guess this is for sort of Cynthia as, as well, is, um, after we've been able to practice a bit or the boats are on the water, can we do another one like these and have Q&A? Because I think like some of this stuff would be so valuable to be able to talk to experts after we've tried to apply some of these things. Absolutely. Um, you know, typically we would have on-water practices and at those on-water practices, we would be sitting around on the grass with a whiteboard right beside the shed and we have a lot of um, <laughs> opportunities to talk. And so this year's going to be really different and um, we'll have to adjust that and it might um, it could be an online discussion after on water practice and with our on water practices we have some of these experienced racers who've been speakers you know ryan and joe Crichton and, and joe ranke and andy crow um, have been regular volunteers who come down and coach in these on water practices which is very very helpful for them to share their knowledge while they're driving a safety boat around, you know, ye yelling through a bullhorn at you about <laughs> hike out or sheet in or whatever. And, um, and that kind of practice is so, so valuable. I mean, for all of you who are new racers to, to hear from an experienced person, because in the race environment, they're not going to be coaching you. They're not going to be giving you tips about how you could do better. Um, the, all they'll be telling you is um, when you're about to break a rule or, you know, you're coming in close contact, you know, in, I, have, I need mark room, things like that. Those are the only things that they'll be talking about from boat to boat. So the racing on water practice is a really, really valuable learning experience for new racers. And I really want to have that happen. Uh, it's just a matter of how and when that will happen. So we can certainly have those on water practices followed up by an online meeting where we can all go to our respective homes and open up a beer and you know have our discussions that way. Cool. Thanks, Cynthia. And, and my second question, John, was I, I'm um, going to need to end the meeting in about uh, three minutes. Okay. Cool. My second my second question, John, was I saw that we're only putting like nine boats instead of seventeen or something. Do you know for the city does that mean we lose our rights to those extra buoys when next year comes around? If they're not no, reserved the, for us. Uh, the plan right now, Joel. The good question. Uh, plan right now is uh, ten buoys, ten boats on ten buoys. Uh, that's what we registered for. Um, but uh, my uh, our general assumption is that all of the buoys on Lake Harriet won't be rented this summer, that there'll be plenty of extra open buoys. And uh, the park board, I believe, has, has told us that we can apply for and get more buoys uh, as the season progresses so that you know we could put more than 10 boats on if we wanted or needed to. Great, thanks, John. Well, thank you, Pat, for hosting and um, recording this. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Everybody have a good day. Well, my pleasure. Thank you to all the presenters. It was fantastic. Okay.
Okay. Thank you.